What's up, everybody? You guys doing good? Come on. Who's excited to be here? Let's go. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's great. You know, we need some energy in the house, and it's not just because I'm insecure and need positive feedback. I mean, we just like to have a good time here, you know? And, uh, man, Jesus is on the throne. Life is good, and uh, I'm excited to get into it. Uh, Man, we've been going through this series called, what is it called? You guys remember what it's called? Long story short, long story short, where we're talking about the four parts of the biblical narrative, and uh, I just want to give you props for coming back because last week was a hard week, okay? Last week, we just talked about why your life is so terrible, why the world sucks, you know, and it, and it just, it's, you can't move on to the solution without addressing the problem in its fullness, right? It's like you guys ever remember uh, being in high school, maybe you're in math class, and the answers are in the back of the book sometimes, and, you know, sometimes you're, you were lucky enough that your teacher accidentally assigned one of the questions that had answers in the back. And, uh, you know, there's a difference where if you just go to the back and write down the answer, you know, the answer is 37. You have no idea what that answer means because you didn't really look at the problem. But if you, like, work yourself to death on the problem and you can't figure it out, you're stuck and you've been laboring, and then you look at the answer, you're like, oh my gosh, yes, I should have known. That makes so much sense. It's it like is life-giving to you to know the answer, right? And so you have to be able to address the, the problem in order to address the solution and receive the solution, okay? And so here's why we're doing the series before we dig into today's topic. We're doing the series because you were born into God's story, Okay, you were not just born into some neutral world where you can kind of just start at zero and do what you want. No, 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 you were born into a world, things are already happening. Things have already been happening, and you need to get up to speed with what God is doing in the world and how you fit into it so that you know how to make the most of your life. You guys know what I'm talking about, okay? Some of you guys do, it's okay, I'll I'll get you there. But here's what we're talking about. So we start with creation. Creation, the four parts are creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration. Can we just say those together? Creation, fall, redemption, restoration, okay? Now, I want you to know this for two reasons. One, you know how your life fits into God's story. That's the biggest reason. But two, this also just gives context for when you're reading the Bible and you're trying to understand man, what does God's word have to say to me and and what is going on in God's word and how does this apply to my life? Well, you can see everything in scripture fits into this framework of creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration. Now, to simplify it, 99.99% of the Bible is the topic we're starting today, redemption, okay? Chapter one and two of Genesis are creation, Chapter 3 is the fall, and then the last two chapters of Revelation are restoration. Everything else is redemption. It's God's redemption plan of fixing things. And I want you to know that. I want you to have that deeply ingrained in your DNA. I am a part of God's story. God is inviting me to be a part of his story and his redemptive plan to restore creation from the fall to the way God made it to be. You all with me? Okay, so I saw this story this week of a, uh, a sculpture that was commissioned in the early 2000s by this Finnish-American sculptor named Eno Kampanen uh, at uh, Kennesaw State University. They had him commission a piece. Uh, you can put up the picture of this, this globe here. This is 175 tons of rock, tons I don't know how many thousands of pounds that is, uh, but it's made of quartzite and then some bronze, and it's uh, it's honoring the the statue is this guy, uh, I think his name is David Brower, he was an environmentalist, and they're honoring him, and uh, um, the goal was that this sculpture would stay for a thousand years as a testament to David Brower's desire to take care of the planet, and uh, and it, you know, it also displayed the fragility of the earth. You know, they're wanting to like, hey, let's take care of the earth and all this stuff. Uh, let, me, let me tell you, the, uh, the idea worked really well. They displayed the fragility of the planet really well because just three months after the sculpture was unveiled, it fell apart. I think I'll show the next one. There it is. 
And I, I think it's slightly ironic. It looks like the statue's crying for help, you know? And here's this just arm sticking out. Help, please, you know? And uh, it's just, there's something just ironic about that, you know? And now it took a year to rebuild the sculpture. And again, their intent was that this would stay for a thousand years. In fact, they added a time capsule inside of the planet when they rebuilt it. And inside the time capsule, which was going to be sealed for a thousand years, they put inside the capsules, they put like articles and papers and all kinds of things trying to answer the question, how can we save planet Earth? Now, unfortunately, last year, 2023, which was only 1.6% of its journey to 1,000 years, the university just dismantled the sculpture and got rid of it. Because it was in such disrepair, it could have collapsed again. And they were like, we've seen this before. That would be very bad. We can't have this collapsing on somebody, 175 tons of rock. And I think this is just, it's very ironic. Uh, but there's something about this where here in this planet that they can't keep together, somehow they're going to solve the question, how can we save the planet? Isn't there something interesting about that? Kind of ironic, huh? And this is the exact position that Adam and Eve are in when we left off yesterday, or last week. They find themselves in this position where they've been created by God in his image, placed in God's super abundant creation, and now they've ruined it. The earth is, it's all falling apart. And they're standing there in the midst of the rubble, and they're like, how do we fix this? How do we put the world back together? They're going to use some really good super glue. Like, what are they going to do? And, and that really is the question that faces us as well. Like, how you answer that question is not just a fairy tale story answer to, you know, whatever in creation. It, it affects the way you live every day today. And that's why we are looking at this. The question is, how will the world be fixed. And in Genesis 3, we see how Adam and Eve respond to that very question. You remember in Genesis 3, verse 7, they, they eat the fruit they're not supposed to. They rebel. They're seeking their own autonomy apart from God. And it says, at, their, at that moment, their eyes were opened, but not to good things like the serpent promised. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Okay, so their eyes are opened, but not, it's not good. They have this realization all of a sudden, oh no, the world is broken and so are we. They feel this deep sense of shame about who they are as people and they, they feel the need. This needs to be fixed. The world needs to be fixed, but how will it happen? And isn't that kind of how it is? Like if you guys have been following Jesus at all and you give into temptation in some way, like on the front end, you're like, this is gonna be amazing. And then three hours later, you're like, the world is broken. I need to fix this. Isn't that how it is? That's just the reality of life. And so how will it fix? How will it be fixed? Will God need to fix it, or can they just do it themselves? Let's see what they do. In the very next line, it says, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Don't worry, God, we fixed it. We sewed some leaves together. We made some clothes out of leaves. Now, how long do you think leaves are going to last? Probably not long. My, my wife did this little craft project with the boys where they made a little Christmas tree and they went and found leaves outside and shoved them into the paper so it looked like kind of a real tree on paper. Uh, they, that only lasted like three days and that was because we weren't allowed to touch it. It was on the counter before it fell apart. Try making clothes and you're moving around in them. I'd give it a few hours maybe, you know. Yeah, and I like to think that maybe one of them was actually like, you know, poison ivy, you know, and God's like, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Bad, bad, not those leaves, you know. Now, this might seem like a small, inconspicuous thing. Okay, they sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. Like, what does that really mean? You know, what do you really get from that? But this is interesting. This is the first, when you read the Bible and you look at history, this is the first of billions and billions of of attempts by the human race to fix their own brokenness. It's the first of billions of attempts to solve our own brokenness problem. And a side note, you're reading the Bible, Genesis 1 through 3, 
is called the seedbed of the Bible. And so every theme you see in all of Scripture can be found in seed form in Genesis 1 through 3. And so we see this, this theme here where Adam and Eve try to solve their own problem. Hey, we don't need God. We don't need to involve him. We, can, we got this. We fixed it. Look at, these, look at these leaves. Isn't this great? Just don't move or breathe, you know? And, you know, as a side note as well, I've been reading this book called Biblical Critical Theory by Christopher Watkins, and, and he uses this language where he talks about these two types of curves, these two shapes for how to deal with the problem of sin. And one is the N-shaped curve. I don't know if you want to put that up there, uh, this graph right here. This is the way that people have been trying to solve their problems ever since Adam and Eve made fig leaves. Every pagan religion was based on this curve where you offer something to God and God responds to your offering by blessing you. So I give a sacrifice and God rewards me. I scratch God's back, God scratches mine in return. I perform and I get a prize. And so it's all based, you can see on this graph, everything that you receive is based on your effort, your ability to offer something good to the gods. And some, some of you today are like, I see no problem with this. Isn't this religion? Isn't this what I'm doing? Yes, this is what many of us are doing, but it's, it's not the right way, as we'll see. But this is the way we live. We say, I perform, I get a prize. Everything in my life comes down to the left side of the arrow. How well can I do to get something from God or from life in general? And it, you can see it looks kind of like a lowercase n, right? So it's, it's n-shaped in that we offer and we get something based on what we offer. And you earn the blessing by what you give. So this attitude doesn't enjoy God for who God is. It uses God as a means to get the blessing from him. You see what I'm saying? It's tit for tat. It's marketplace. It's let me make a deal with God. God, I don't, I don't really care about you so much as I care about what you can give me. And so I'll offer you whatever you want so I can get what I want. And so you might offer things like, you know, good works, being a good person, um, coming to church, you know, worshiping, going to prayer meetings, leading a Bible study. You might give your money or your time and serve. You, you know, you, you can come do many of the things that we're doing, but do them through this lens. I'm doing this so that I can give something good enough to God so I can get what I want. You might offer your prayers. And, and again, some of you are like, this is exactly my life. This is how we do this. Now, the worst ancient pagan god of them all, you see this in the Old Testament, is this god named Moloch. Have you guys heard of Moloch before? Moloch demanded the sacrifice, not just of food and animals, but of human children. And so you see in this picture, people would willingly sacrifice their children to this god. They would kill them. You know, they'd burn them as an offering to this God in return for whatever kind of a blessed life they thought that this God could give them. Does this sound familiar? Like, it almost is like, we do we see this in our world today? Where people are sacrificing their children for whatever they think is the good life. Yes, that's like the abortion industry today, isn't it? This is Planned Parenthood. I will sacrifice my kids so I can get the good life that I want. So you see, this is still happening today. Because you might not consider yourself religious. Like, yeah, yeah, I don't do the religion thing. That's for losers. Like, that's a fairy tale. You, people still do this in an unreligious way in our secularized society where instead of giving a uh, sacrifice to God or the gods or however you want to think of it, it's the God of efficiency. It's efficiency. Everything is a means to an end. So whatever means get you your desired end, then those are the means that you use. And so what does this mean? That life, life isn't a gift. Life is a grind. Because remember, go back to the N-shaped curve. Everything depends on my ability to give something so I get what I want. And so everything becomes about how can I use things as efficiently as possible to get what I want. And so we use people in this way, right? I'm not friends with you because you're an incredible person. I just delight in your friendship and I love just being together. No, 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 no. I'm using you to get what I want, right? We, I see this when people get married sometimes and it's like you see this in their vows, 
And it's like, well, I was really just a sad person until you fixed me, and that's why we're getting married. Yeah, um, well, what happens when they no longer can fix you? Like, you, and people do. They just, well, they, they couldn't make me happy anymore, so I, I guess we fell out of love, and we needed to move on. And you see this in people's vows. It's like, I vow, you know, like, it's not even like vowing anything. They're just saying, like, you make me happy, and you're really pretty, and, you know, things like that. And this is why I like the classic vows that talk about, like, suffering and being poor together. You know what I'm saying? Like, it makes me, in, it makes me kind of mad when I go to weddings and it's just like all of the vows are like light. Like, I promise to hug you every day. Okay, well, what about if you get cancer? Are you going to stick it out with this person? Or are you just using this person to scratch your back? You see what I'm saying? Everything becomes this about efficiency and how can I use the things in my life to get the good life that I want? And so even marriage and friendship, your job can be like this, right? Think about the super abundance of creation. Your job was supposed to be a gift from God to partner with the Lord to be, be productive and bring the kingdom of God in your life. But now it's not that. It's just a means to an end. I just need a paycheck, so whatever. It doesn't have to be that way. Some of you might be thinking, well, that's easy for you. Maybe you have your dream job. I work at Dylan's or something. Let me tell you, you can have your, your dream job. You can be passionate about wherever God has placed you. You know, in the New Testament, Paul talks to slaves. And he says, hey, even if you stay a slave your whole life, you can serve God in that position. Like, the way you do it is you pretend, you, you, you not pretend, you imagine that God himself is your boss. And you live every day. Like you're serving God. You're not just serving this person. You're serving God. And so you might be like, well, I haven't found my passion yet. Well, let me tell you, you can find your passion at your job. You can find your passion where you are. You, can you serve Jesus there? Can you love people there? Can you use your gifts and talents there? Yes, it might not be your dream job, but you can find your passion at place. You guys see what I'm saying? Come on, I, I'm, I'm going to need some more response here this morning, okay? So, the, we see this in a non-religious way, and there's this French uh, philosopher named Jacques Ellul who calls this technique. He uses this word technique, and he sums this up, where technique is like, it's the lens of seeing the world through this way, where everything is a means to an end. Everything is about technique. It's about efficiency. It's about our methods, and it's not about enjoying the gift of God's creation. It's about using it to get what we want with the best technique. Even, you know, we use God like this. I meant last week I mentioned, you know, how gratitude, um, or maybe it was two weeks ago, I forget, but we talked about gratitude, you know, is, is kind of a cure for anxiety. And we just celebrated Thanksgiving this week. And you can use God for his gifts instead of enjoying God himself. And something like Thanksgiving, like, oh, I have this gratitude journal because I have anxiety. I need to solve my anxiety problem. So I'll, I'll just use whatever I can find that will solve anxiety for me. So I have this gratitude journal. Or I'm, I'm trying to be more thankful. And it's kind of like getting the cart before the horse. You see what I'm saying? Like, like God is inviting us into this deep relationship that changes our lives. And then that gratitude should be a natural result instead of like, I'm going to try to have gratitude so it solves my anxiety. So I can keep doing what I want. Like, no, you're getting it backwards. If you just come into relationship with God, that will eventually solve all those things. And uh, I saw, you, you guys ever seen Parks and Rec? Parks and Rec is a hilarious show. And the main character, Leslie, is interested in this guy named Justin. And he's this really fun person. He travels a lot. He's all these hilarious stories. And he's, you know, the life of the party and all these things. And she's really interested in him for a while. And they kind of have this romantic spark, but then at the end of the episode, he, like, just leaves. And it's not clear why he leaves. He just kind of disappears. And so she's left hanging like, man, what was that about? And, and her friend, Ron, says, he's a tourist. He's a tourist. He's just vacationing in people's lives, takes pictures, puts them in his scrapbooks, and he moves on. All he's interested in are stories. Basically, Leslie, he's selfish, and you're not. That's why you don't like him. That's this idea. We just use people. We use God. We use God's gifts to get what we want. And think about that God, Moloch, I told you about for a second, where this is a very extreme example where people sacrifice their children on this altar to get what they want. In their minds, they, they might easily think they're controlling the God, Moloch, by twisting his arm to get what they want. But at the end of the day, if you're sacrificing your children, who's controlling who? 
Who's controlling who? And it's the same way with us. Whatever you are using as your technique or your method to try to get the good life that you want from this life and try to fix yourself and make something of yourself, at some point, you're not controlling that anymore. That thing's controlling you, right? Your job, you're like, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm sacrificing just a little time with my family so this job can really, I can make something of myself. Hey, at some point, you might be sacrificing so much, you think you're controlling your job. Your job's really controlling you. You see what I'm saying? You're running after money. If money becomes the thing that you're running your life after, at some point, that's no longer a tool. You're its tool. And there's this movie from 100 years ago that um, I haven't seen, but it's, it's on the list of, like, the top 10 greatest movies of all time. I think maybe for, like, really artsy people maybe. Um, but there's this movie called Metropolis, and it's from the 1920s, made by this guy named Fritz Lang. And there's this scene where he, he's trying to critique things in culture, and he shows the scene where all of these factory workers are going into this factory. And, and in the movie, he's, he's just making it clear these, these guys are just grinding their lives to dust in this factory because they're trying to just get money to have the life they want and, you know, all those things. And so and in this movie, all of these guys go into the factory, and then if you want to show the picture, the factory transforms into Moloch himself. And so he calls it the Moloch machine. And it's basically this, this symbolism that you think you're using these things to get the life you want. In reality, you're only sacrificing your life to a false god. You're attempting to solve your problem in and of yourself. And you're only destroying yourself in the process. And all of this that we just talked about, the N-shaped curve, the Moloch machine, all of that is a result of when we think we are in charge of our redemption. When we think we are in charge of our redemption, this is the result. When we answer the question, how will the world be fixed? And we say, I will do it. That's what happens. But what does God do? Does God come to the scene and see Adam and Eve's leaves does he laugh at them and say, nah, try harder. Show me, show me a better effort and I'll come back and see if it's good enough. No, in Genesis 3, 21, it says, the Lord made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. He just says, I'll do it for you. I will do it. Did they do anything to earn this from God? They say, God, let's do a dance so you make us some clothes that are better than leaves. Let's perform so you give us the prize. No, they didn't do anything. They did nothing. In fact, they done like negative something. They like made things worse. But God says, no, 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 hey, I love you because I'm generous and I love you. I want to help. Let me involve myself in your situation. He initiates with them. And I noticed three things about this. One, our solution doesn't work. Our solution doesn't work. Two, God's solution is a gift. And three, you'll notice something has to die. How do you get animal skins for clothes? You kill an animal. And it's the first sacrifice in the entire Bible where God kills an animal to cover the shame of Adam and Eve's nakedness. So you see, their solution didn't work. God's solution was a free gift because of God's love and generosity. And something had to die in order for them to receive it. And so let's think about this. The N-shaped arc will never work. All of your attempts to cover your own shame will never work. You think like, I just need to, I just need to tweak my technique a little bit. I'm almost, at, I'm almost there. No, it's never going to work. Just stop. Just put the fig leaves down. It's never going to work. In fact, in Isaiah, Isaiah prophesies, he says, all of us have become like those who are unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf. I wonder if he's talking about the fig leaves. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind takes us away. Can I tell you something really shocking? In, in the Hebrew, the word that, that we translate polluted garment, uh, let me tell you, the, the translators are being very generous with you. They're being very pg because the actual word is a used menstrual cloth. That is the actual literal word that Isaiah said. 
So if you'll allow me, he's basically saying every good thing you think you can do apart from God is a used tampon. This is the Bible, folks. I didn't write this. Like you think I'm so good, I'm almost on the verge of fixing my life. No, no this, this is what God says about that. Like it's not really accomplishing anything like what you think it is. Romans 3, Paul picks up on this exact same idea. And he says that no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And you might think, like, man, that's a little harsh. Like, no one does anything good. Like, we have iPhones. Surely someone can do something good, right? But this doesn't, he's not necessarily saying, like, no acts are, you know, good in and of themselves. What he's saying is when we try to answer the question, who will fix the world, and we say, we will do it, he's saying, no, 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 no. you have nothing to contribute. You have nothing to contribute to the redemption of the world. And when you initiate and you lead the charge trying to fix your own life, it never works. So you might be able to spin, you know, the plates on the, on the things for a while, but it's never really going to accomplish what you think it will. And so our solution doesn't work, too. God's solution is a gift. You notice he initiates of his own free will. Even earlier in the story when they first, you know, realize they're naked and they hide from God, what does God do? Does God sit in his throne room and say, well, they'll come to me when they're sorry. Like, they need to come earn this. No, that's what we do, right? When you get mad at somebody, you're like, they need to come ask me to, you know, to forgive them. I'm not going to them. No, God, God goes to them. And he says, hey, where are you? He initiates. He seeks out relationship with them. While they're hiding, he comes and seeks them out. And so we see this principle where it is our nature to hide from God, but it's the character of God to seek us out. Is that good news to anybody this morning? It is our nature to hide from God, but it's God's character to seek us out. What does that mean? That means no one is here in church just because you're a good person and you just love God naturally. No, you're a terrible person and you naturally hide from God. But guess what? You responded to God initiating with you first. And that's why you're here. You're here because God has been searching for you your entire life. He's been knocking on the door saying, hey, how about now? You want to come out from hiding now? Oh, not yet? I'll come back another time. He comes back the next day. Hey, where are you at? Come out from behind the tree. Hey, let's, let's, let's figure out this relationship together. And so everything that you do toward God, you did not initiate. He initiated. You are responding. And so God's solution is a gift. And instead of the N-shaped curve, if you want to put the next one on, we see what looks like a U-shaped curve. God flips it. He flips it. And he says, guess what? This is no longer performance leads to reward. This is my blessing leads to response. And so instead of us having to initiate and lead the charge, God, is my offering good enough? Is my life good enough to get what I want? No, no, no. God says, hey, it'll never be good enough. But guess what? I will bless you first. And then everything else is a response to the blessing of God. All of our stewardship, all of our hard work and responsibility comes as a response to what God has given me. And so now, it, this totally changes the game on my work, right? I'm not working so that I can figure out if I'm a good enough person. Am I finally worthwhile? Did I make my dad happy, right? All of that stuff. No, no, no. It's God has given me so much. I owe it to God to be responsible, to be faithful, to be a good steward. And I, it, everything is an act of worship and gratitude toward God because of what he's given me. It's amazing. God reverses this N-shaped dynamic. And this is the first instance in the Bible of mercy and grace, where mercy is you don't get what you do deserve. They're not just murdered by God right there. That's what they deserved. He could have just ended the human race. Nah, this, is, this didn't work. Let's start over. And he gives them grace. Grace is the, the opposite side of the coin, where you get something you don't deserve. He says, hey, you know what? You don't deserve my help, but... Let me make animal skins. Let me show you a better way. Let me show you how we can fix this together. And this leads to an attitude not of performance or technique or seeing everything as a means to an end. This, this leads to an attitude of bounty. Everything is, an, is bountiful. God has given me so much. And, you know, the difference between these two arcs is the N-shaped arc of technique is manipulative tries to twist God's arm to get what I want. 
But the U-shaped arc of bounty is, is receptive. I just receive all of these good things from God. The N-shaped arc uses God to enjoy his gifts. The U-shaped uses God's gifts to enjoy God. So our solution doesn't work. God's solution is a gift. And number three, something has to die. This is hard for us as Americans where we just want everything to be nice. And God, God can't, can't God just like overlook it? Like it wasn't that big of a deal. But God's holiness, which is shocking to us as Westerners right now, where we're just like so ramped up on like worldly compassion that it's just like lost, it's off the rails God's holiness demands a response to sin. The good news is, though, is his love for us provides a way through it for us. Right? Notice he doesn't kill Adam and Eve. He has to kill something, so he kills the animal to cover our shame. So he has to deal with it, but he provides an opportunity for us to get through it. Notice the themes here from the first week of superabundance, of gift, of relationship. It's almost like even though we screwed everything up, God never changes. He still wants to treat us with super abundance and give us his gifts, and he still wants to be in relationship with us. It's amazing. Now, God takes this one step further. I want to show you just three quick connections from beginning to the end of the Bible. Genesis 3.15. This is called the Proto-Evangelion. This is the first gospel message preached in the whole Bible. Right here, Genesis 3.15. God is, is responding to sin. And he's, you know, there's punishment, there's a curse involved, and he's talking to the serpent himself, and he says, I will put enmity between you, the snake, and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and then he says, he shall crush your head, and you shall strike his heel. So he's talking to the snake, he's cursing the snake, and then he says, some human being in the future will come who will crush your head. And although you strike his heel, some translations say bruise his heel, he will crush your head. What is he prophesying? He's prophesying that someone will come who will end evil forever and put things back to the way it was supposed to be. So even in the curse, there is hope for the solution. Jump to Romans 16. Paul alludes to this, and he says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under whose feet? Your feet. He's talking to Christians. So he doesn't just say this one person in the future, we know that's Jesus, will crush Satan. Now he's saying, no, 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 all of you, followers of Jesus, will crush Satan through the power of God in your life. Now jump to Revelation 12.1 at the very end of the Bible. This is the Apostle John. He talks about the believers who overcame the devil in their life, and he said they conquered him. How did they do it? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. You guys see, see how this is working. God says, I will crush the head of the snake. I will kill evil in this world. And then in the New Testament, guess what? I want to use you to crush the head of the snake if you receive the sacrifice of Jesus, if you're covered by the blood of the lamb and your testimony. It's amazing. So what, is this, what does this leave us with? No, three things. One, put down the fig leaf. Just put down the fig leaf. Stop trying to cover the shame of your own nakedness. Try, stop trying to solve your sin problem. Stop trying to fix your life apart from God. Number two, receive God's solution. Your righteousness is like a filthy rag, but God can clothe you in glory. And three, let your old life die. Something has to die. Let your old life die. I was thinking about this, you know, the more that you allow your old life to die, Jesus had to die for us. He was the ultimate sacrifice. But then we're told, like, if you follow Jesus, you have to, like, crucify your old life. You have to let your old life die. And it's, it's like the more you allow your old life to die, the more your testimony increases. The more your life is changed because you're allowing your old life to die. Guess what? You know what? You come to Jesus because your life is broken and messed up. But then so many of us are trying to hold on to our old life. But yeah, but Jesus, just don't change that. And Jesus is like, that is the reason you needed me. So like, maybe let go of that. Some of you are like nudging your friends. Like, I'm tell I've been telling you about that person, right? And let me just tell you just quickly about, 
you know, my own life, this, I've seen this in my own life where it's hard to receive help from other people, isn't it? Because it feels like they're better than you and, you know, all of that. Like, ah. But if you want God to change your life, you have to admit that you need his help. And I grew up in the church. I, you know, as a pastor's kid, I knew all of this in my head, but I had never experienced it myself until I allowed some of my old life to die and actually receive the gift of God. I was a very insecure person, was very quiet, very shy. Uh, people actually who knew me back then are shocked. Like, you speak to people every week. This, this does not make sense, you know. Because I was just so afraid of what people thought of me. I couldn't put myself out there in any way. And, uh, and then in college, I wanted to follow Jesus. But again, I was so afraid. I was scared of what people thought about me. And in college... There was this moment where I felt like God was like, hey, if you really want to do this, let's do it. But you're going to have to allow some things to die. And I remember my senior year, one of the techniques I had used, one of the methods for fixing my life was music. I performed. I played music. I wrote songs. And I thought I was going to be a rock star someday. And that was going to be the way I could fix, you know, this, this shame and insecurity. Well, if I could just show everyone how amazing I am, then the world will like me, and, and then I'll be okay. And that was the, the end-shaped curve. It was technique to get something from God, right? And there's this moment my senior year said, hey, if you really want to do this, I need you just to give up music altogether. Just like, and so I had this drum set, and I felt like the Lord was like, just throw your drum set in the trash. And there's like two minutes of arguing. I was like, did I make that up? I think I made that up. I don't think that was the Lord which is like always how it goes when God asks you to do something that's hard. And about two minutes in, I was like, I know this is the Lord, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to regret not doing this. And so I, I took my drum set out to the curb. I went to class. I was in college. I went to class, came back a few hours later. It was gone. And a few, you may have heard me tell a story, but my wife is like, that, you know what? I bet some mom drove by and picked it up. And now some famous rock star got their start because they found your drum set, you know. So that's absolutely, I know for a fact that's totally what's tr what happened. Yeah, we didn't have ring doorbells back then. And let me tell you, the more you allow yourself to put the fig leaf down, give up the N-shaped curve, give up the technique, give up the method, it's never going to work. Receive from God what he wants to give you. He has a calling on your life. He has an identity on your life. He has a purpose for your life. You can't strive and make it for yourself. You need to receive it from God. Even to this day, I am tempted to go back to technique. Oh, man, I'm feeling insecure. But if I grew my church, then that would solve everything. Yes, people in the church still do this. But guess what? No, you got to be like, no, 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 no. That's what got me into this. I need to receive from the Lord. Everything I have is a gift from God. And so let me encourage you. Let's put down the fig leaves, receive God's solution, and let your old life die. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for the gift of redemption. Lord, thank you for the gift of the good news, the gospel that we don't have what it takes. That actually is good news because it allows us to go to the one who does have what it takes. Jesus, I thank you that you are in the life-fixing business. You are in the world-building business. You're taking that sculpture that crumbled apart, and you're building it back together the right way. You're doing it in history. You're doing it in all of the world, and you're doing it in each of our lives. And so let's just take advantage of this holy moment right now and come before the spirit of the living God that is in this place right now and open our hearts, bear our souls to the, to the Father, the creator who loves us and say, God, here I am. God, here I am. I think there's two kinds of people here. Just as we're praying, I'm reminded of the, the story of the prodigal son. We have one type of person who's running from God. And that might be some of you today. Somehow someone convinced you to come to church, but you've been running from God. God is inviting you. Hey, just stop. Just stop running. Turn around. Come back. 
But some of you guys are like the older brother in the story. He has all of the appearances of looking like he's in the family, but then he's mad at God for throwing the younger brother a party. And just have this feeling like, like the older brother is like trying to perfect his technique. He's been silently just perfecting, like if I get better and better, then, then my father will finally give me something. And God is like, I've given you everything already. It's all been yours this whole time. Did you not know? I think many of us are like that right now. Christians in the room, you love Jesus, but you're still just trying to build this thing yourself. And God says, hey, I've given you everything already. Just receive it. And so, Lord, God, we put down our, our fig leaves. We receive the life and blessing you have for us. And, God, if there's something in us that you, you're asking us to surrender, to sacrifice, to give up as a response, some, some roadblock, maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's some habit, maybe it's some secret sin and you're asking us to come into the light with, God, let us have the courage to put the stake in the sand. I'm letting my old life die here today. I'm a new creation. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. We love you. What an honor to be in your kingdom with you and with these amazing people. In Jesus' name, amen.